Welcome to the Ohio Arts Council's Rife Gallery Programming Series for our current show, A New World, Ohio Women to Watch 2023, a collaboration with the Ohio Advisory Group of the National Museum of Women in the Arts in Washington, DC. Today, we are thrilled to present artist Miguel Arimo. As a brief reminder, everyone tuning in today is in listen-only mode. Please feel free to utilize the chat function to ask questions, and we'll be sure to get to them during the Q&A portion of the hour. Also, please keep in mind that because we're presenting from separate locations, there may be some variation of bandwidth, so if one of us freezes up or the sound fluctuates, thanks in advance for bearing with us. Okay, thanks all, and welcome, Miguel. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, first of all, I just wanted to thank all the um, Kat and also her staff at the Yale Rife Gallery for mounting this show and assisting us for a future touring of the show. So I'm very excited, but it's also um, Ohio Advisory Board for assisting us for in terms of a National uh, Museum for Women in Arts uh, show. So I really thank all of you. Um, so today I'm going to uh, talk about my recent work um, and just a little bit of background and then how my work developed the last um, five, six years um, showing different work. So um, I was born in Tokyo and grew up in Tokyo um, in the 1980s, uh, early 80s, I came to Ohio. Um, I was, um, Ohio was not my final destination, but I stopped off in Yellow Springs, Ohio in the United States. Um, so this is my two landscape um, it was a, quite a shocking to actually not to land on a big city, but it's in Ohio where we are surrounded by cornfield and coming from actually right in the middle of Tokyo where actually my high school might be very visible in this left picture. Uh, my high school was maybe five, 10 minutes walk from Tokyo Tower. And over the years, uh, my whole idea of being in the States is try to learn English and try to um, understand the culture. But at the same time, I was sort of back and forth between these two culture. And my work always uh, addressed that about the being between and also, over the years, uh, that being betweenness uh, stopped being a conflict, but it's also a space to embrace and really think about um, new idea that it only comes from that space, which is a slippage. Um, so I just wanted to explain my slippage. Slippage or the points of disjunction, interrupted continuity of land and time, the fragility of connection, mistakes, and failure. In whatever form slippage takes, physical, political, or cultural, we become censors and experience the slippage as shifted sense of equilibrium. In try to regain balance, we notice remember, observe, measure, witness, suspect, and probe. Some look at nature with inquisitive eyes. Some pay attention to a subtle shift in use of language. Some become activists. Some bring themselves together as a community of learners. So this whole space of uh, gap space or slippage, um, that it's no longer for me it was a binary conflict, but it's also it's more like a um, it's a unique vantage point um, that I can look at my surroundings and 
create work from that. Uh, one of the example is the day before tomorrow, sites and footprints of ICE detention centers, 2019. So there was a um, there was a many news on uh, about the detention center in 2018, 2019. And I was paying close attention to it and also uh, attending many rallies, direct action on the street. And this work is um, one of the things I learned is that how many detention centers are in this country. And I started looking at it and I ended up visiting each site that it's listed. Uh, with the Google map and looking at the, each building, and this is a footprint of buildings that is drawn on the pages of dictionary. And each one is uh, comes with the uh, addresses of the uh, detention center, but it's also measurements of the building. And how some of the uh, buildings are very small, but some are a huge compound. And this is Aurora contract detention facility in Colorado. This is one in Texas. This is pretty big um, in Nevada. Let me show you, go, go back. So what I wanted to also create is the sense of um, opaqueness. Even though we knew all this uh, facility exists and we hear so much about the, um, the immigration, the detention uh, situation, not many, uh, information are available. So what I wanted to create was by creating this footprint and make it into a black drawings. As a result, it looks uh, similar to a redacted document. And also I created a five boxes nearby that I installed on the wall with the uh, artificial birds. And those boxes are um, sort of a mimics the um, bird houses, but it has a many blind spots. So that what's happening inside is not quite visible. And you see the uh, birds are stuck in the inside. So it's not like regular bird houses, but the uh, uh, it really sort of a, uh, makes the viewer curious what they are. And also I, um, it's about 60, 70 birds were positioned and throughout the gallery. And also uh, each time I, mounted this uh, piece, I created the uh, small zin um, so that people can take away when they leave the gallery. And it's talk about what these ICE detention centers are and also who operates our ICE detention facilities. Also importantly, who profits from immigration detentions and detention facility contracts. So all those uh, information that we didn't know, what we don't know, uh, I tried to sort of uh, make the, provide the information about that. Um, and also each 
location, I make sure that in that state where the, those detention facilities are and also uh, local resources. Um, what I did was the, uh, when I did the yeah, Google map search, a lot of places were actually, um, when you see it in the uh, street map, street view, I could not find the uh, building based on their the list of addresses that government provided. And uh, it turns out some places are, uh, you know, privately owned buildings. And it was so new that it was not even built when the last time the Google map image was created. So there was a lot of uh, uh, reality that I was sort of uh, learning from just visiting each site. Um, And also uh, you see this pages of dictionary and this is the dictionary of um, dictionary of the underworld. These are the list of words um, that it's depict the underworld. And so people immediately think this is just a regular dictionary, but each page, if people randomly land their eyes, they will encounter the kind of a word that being applied to uh, people, do we think it's uh, others? So this has that another layer of uh, meaning in this installation. And similar time, I also created this piece called the signal. It's a Morse code. Silence, silent and silenced poem by woman. And I'm sure most of you here uh, know about Morse code, but this is actually when I presented some young people, they some people did not know. So these are the Morse code that was used for uh, communication for distance communication. And what I did was, sorry. This is an installation of a signal. And it's uh, the work on the fabric, linen. Um, what I did was I collected uh, writings by a woman from different culture. And these women, uh, by writing pieces in their culture, either they're risking their lives uh, or they're under the sort of a oppressed environment for women to be expressive. So what I did was I collected these writings and in English, and then I encoded them to Morse code, which is the dash and um, slash. And then I embroider them on the linen. And the other sort of aspect of this work is that um, during the World War II, um, Japanese women had this practice of creating, uh, it's called a thousand needles. Um, they get this cotton fabric and they make a French knot, uh, several, and then pass to another woman, mother, sisters, and daughters and they create another uh, French knots. And they created 1,000 or even more red thread French knot on the fabric. And then give it to uh, soldiers who takes off to the war. And of course, many of them are, uh, you know, those kamikaze soldiers who get on a plane 
uh, as a suicide play. So quietly, what they're saying is um, go off for the country, but it's also quietly their messages come back alive. And this was a um, metaphor for amulet. So the, the soldiers will wrap their, uh, put this in their uh, garment inside. So I kind of wanted to also draw that inspiration from that practice and how the woman's uh, silent sort of solidarity are embedded in this um, stitching. And a lot of them, like uh, uh, small ones that you see here, are also um, the poem that I found. It's an Afghan poem. The is a form of poem. It's called the Landes, and these are the uh, by Afghan women. And because of the environment, they were only exchanged or communicated these poems through orally, so they whisper to each other, but never write it, write them down. Um, but lande is, I think it means, translates poisonous snakes. So what they write is about love, lust, anger, frustration, the sort of things that they are not allowed, culturally allowed to express in the daily lives. And then usually I provide the written, uh, handwritten um, text so that people can learn about those women. Um, next one, it's called the huin. Huin means in Japanese called the sealed. It's a plastic uh, B-29 model plane parts. So I was about 2018, 2019, I was thinking about um, archives a lot. And I I did uh, one installation uh, addressing that, how we uh, remember things and how country remembers things. And this is the uh, box car, which dropped the uh, bomb on Nagasaki which is being housed in 20 minutes from where I live in Yellow Springs. And this is the Air Force Museum in Fairborn, the next town. And so this one is um, a part of one to 48 scale model of B-29 warplane, including the Fat Man, which is a bomb that dropped on Nagasaki in linen and hand-stitched clothes then pinned on board. Um, each one is wrapped with a linen and then stitched very tightly and, and then display them in this way before the, you assembled into a whole plane and number them and then display as if these are almost like a specimens uh, but it's also, um, I wanted to create the kind of uh, parts or before words becomes a sentence, becomes a narrative. And I wanted to kind of address the idea of how do we both as an individual and as a nation construct a narrative of war in a culture telling. Um, And also including the frames, those parts comes uh, comes in, and I wrap them in a th red thread. This is the same red uh, embroidery floss that I use for the uh, Morse code.
and just the sort of a, a same sort of a, a carrying on the similar idea to um, recording it or archiving it, I number them, uh, each pieces. And on the right one is the actual fat man. And some of the um, some of the pieces almost uh, remind you of bones, the shape shape of bones. But it's also the stitches becomes like a sutures on the skin. So who builds assembles the narrative? Whose stories are missing? And what is the act of remembering the past? What gets altered or erased along the way? And how do these memories become history? So that's what I uh, wanted to address through this work. This is called the proximity of syllables. Uh, this is the one that I show at the Western Gallery. Uh, you enter the installation through this, the parentheses, the, through the this markings and you are entering into a, a space of books, pages, writings, many syllables. And uh, this is, I'm borrowing the uh, word of a Susan Burns who described my installation, a space of meaning made not by what is directly stated, but by what it is implied, unsaid, sidelined, redacted, absent, and hidden. This is the uh, installation view. So, uh, I use my material for uh, my conceptual work. Uh, choice of material is an integral part of a concept of any given work and varies from work to work. I deploy various material strategies in the hope that the material itself reveals and articulates the hidden layer of ideas. And I will show you the example. Um, this one is called uh, In Broad Daylight. Department of Homeland Security Monitoring Wards. So this one is uh, in 2012, the following the Freedom of Information request in the lawsuit, the Department of Homeland Security was forced to release the analyst desktop binder, over 300 monitoring wards for online activities against terrorism. And I was just stunned the kind of words that they were monitoring on our online activities. But it's also those lists were invisible for us, from us. Um, and what I did was using this broad daylight as a kind of concept to start with. Um, I took the paper and then I prepare the each pages paper with the cyanotypes. Uh, those are the the people, even the grade school kids, make it a uh, sun print by putting a uh, leaves and flowers, and then put against uh, under the sun, and then wash it up uh, later. You wash it, and then becomes a blueprint, and then you can see the shadow being a white. So this is the same technique that I prepare the page by exposing sunlight. Uh, now, in Ohio, the Freedom Information Act is called the Sunshine Law. So this is literally, I'm using that as metaphor to create this paper uh, by exposing a sunshine. And, and then, um, I typed 
using old type, you know, old fashioned typewriter. And I used the uh, uh, white whiteouts, the, the kind of a white sheet that you insert in a typewriter and then punch the um, letter that was originally used for uh, to erase words. If you make a mistake, you go back space and then you put the uh, white sheets and then type again. And then that exact location of the type of the letters gets uh, white out. So what originally was uh, in order to erase or hide uh, those words. But here against the dark background, those white out or things that you want to hide becomes visible. And these are the some of the words that they were listening. Homegrown. Blood. And also, this is the close up of the wall of the gallery space. And I carved out uh, these period and uh, commas and uh, actual punctuation marks directly uh, carving out of the wall to create the whole room becomes a part of a, a document or writing paper. <clears throat> and this one is uh, called the Harvard Sentences. And Harvard Sentences is um, during the World War II, it was a uh, um, Harvard University's one of the basement. There was a psycho psychoacoustic lab uh, was researching the kind of uh, to in order to improve the communication uh, between warplanes. Uh, a lot of problem uh, they were having for the soldier, the pilot is a day, it's very difficult to hear uh, because of the quality of uh, head, headset and helmet. So they were tasked to create the good sort of an audio testing mechanism. And what they did was the uh, creating a banal sample phrases for audio testing. And it's about 720 sentences. And these are, each phonetically balanced, but the actual meaning is, of course, the each sentence makes sense, but there's no desire to communicate the content. It's only to listen clearly. Uh, so what I did was I, again, using similar to the Morse code uh, booklet that I created using a red ink, and I drew these sentences on that paper. And again, I number them. And you can see um, room was crowded with a wild mob or dill pickles are uh, your sour, but taste fine. It, it just, uh, it does not have any expectation of being responded to by a listener. Um, so purely there for a sound. And then what I did was I recorded each sentences and then I created the wave uh, wavelength and then printed. And because 720 altogether, uh, this pieces were 1,440 pieces. And this one is um, the report, it's called. Um, after 2011 earthquake in Japan, uh, TEPCO, the Tokyo, Ele uh, Tokyo Electric Power Company, uh, you know, have to de deal with that uh, nuclear accident and the power nuclear power plant. And uh, one of the things they did was they presented uh, by re request by the government uh, a document of their safety protocol and uh, 12 page long. And 
under the name of security reason, over 90% of document was uh, redacted. So what I did was I created the 12 panel of a plaster and recreated the redacted area of the document uh, is the one that you see in sort of a, a shape on the plaster. And again, this is a material sort of a choice. The, um, the why plaster is that in a crime scene, people pour plaster to get the uh, footprints of a criminal. So I kind of wanted to mimic that idea of uh, um, crime scene and try to sort of uh, remember um, that footprint. And then um, Strangers Bundles, Hours of Woods. This is the, uh, a, a piece that I, I'm showing currently at the Rife Gallery. And it says pandemic, daily walks, residency in woods. Um, so early 2020, uh, the Ohio early on in March, we had a shutdown and, but we were allowed to um, take a walk nearby. So I was doing a daily walk and, you know, in Yellow Springs, we were very fortunate to have uh, many places to walk in nature. And, um, and it, you know, eventually some of the, the nature reserve was open. So people continued to walk and then I did too. But at the same time during the pandemic, there's a many opportunity of exhibits or lecture workshop were canceled. So I was started thinking, what if like I gave myself um, made up residency in the woods since I'm walking every day and looking at the nature, uh, if I were to do a residency there, what sort of a work would I make? And that's what I did with the strangers bundles. And I was, before I started, I was thinking, you know, during the pandemic, all of a sudden the safety of a home became a dangerous place because um, enclosed space became dangerous. People became dangerous. Being out in the nature is the uh, safe place. So I was thinking about that and to create the kind of work like that. Um, and this is the uh, Chapel Hill uh, when I eventually had a show there and using this um, piece. And these, um, these are, um, right now I'm showing five of them at the Rife Gallery. Um, each one, it's, I'm calling it bundle. Uh, it comes with a strap and then also a pegboard so that uh, this piece, a bundle is opened and then hung on the pegboard. And, uh, it's being used as sort of a cotton fabric, sort of very sort of a utilitarian fabric. It's not a decorative. And each one has a different thoughts um, and a very um, different type of thoughts that kind of uh, align at the uh, temporary alignment of many different thoughts on woods. And one of the things that I, uh, this piece is the um, invasive plants or alien species. And this is a 19, 1990, uh, 92 uh, executive presidential executive order of uh, alien species. And it, um, this is the um, a document. And this is the part of a definition of alien species that I took um, from to stamp on this fabric. 
The alien species means with the respect to a particular ecosystem, any species including its seeds, eggs, spores, or other biological material capable of propagating that species that is not native to that ecosystem. Um, over the years, the last 10 years or so, I've been really paying attention to how people speak about invasive spe uh, plants, eradication, enemy, bad nature, get rid of it. Um, and although I totally understand that the importance of uh, controlling, but it's also every time I hear those conversations, the part of me aches um, as an immigrant. And uh, so inside or between those uh, definition is the uh, the choice of words that are being used both in immigration conversation, but it's also um, alien species, invasive plants, animals conversation, uh, management, introduction, disturbance, flora non grata, fear, bad nature, homeland, immigrant, impact. Um, so that's what you see in this. And then also, um, those are the simple drawings, pen and ink drawings of um, plants. And, you know, the right reason, the obvious reason, they all have um, where they come from, Japanese, Japanese nutweed, uh, Japanese silt grass, Russian olive, Oliver, uh, Oliver, Russian Oliver, stuff like that. And the other bundle also, um, it's, um, I was thinking about, this is another aspect of others, um, essential workers during the pandemics. And I read the article about some of those undocumented uh, the immigrant people were afraid of going to hospital or um, afraid of getting COVID by working and because they cannot go to hospital, they were afraid of being exposed and being found out. And I was thinking about um, by walking in the woods and how animals create the burrows and covers to hide and and I was also thinking about this um immigrant people um so I created sort of a almost like a worker's garment by made the burrows and covers as if this is the auto mechanic name but it's creating a custom made label and then uh made the uh, pockets and sleeves but it also mimics the uh, hiding place, burrows and holes and tunnels and that you find in nature. Um, 2020 is not only a pandemic year, but it's also George Floyd happened and also election was going on. So in spite of having to be careful from you know with each other, we did a lot of many um, street activities like uh, um, direct actions and rallies. And so how much of that was reflected in my meditation in the woods is not so much about how beautiful the woods are, but it's also uh, how much the um, woods show us what we are doing outside of nature on the street. Um, and this one is a postcard. It's a national parks postcard that I collected. And then I whited out, painted over all of the sort of a presence of a human being uh, and only the land that I left 
um, so like a lake on the boat or information center or some sort of a path, fences, they're all erased. And then on top of it, I was kind of playing the idea of, uh, you know, national park. What is that sort of a, as a kind of a, a person who uses the English as a second language. And uh, so I can kind of uh, naively play with the idea of, so what is the nationality of nature? What is national park? Who owns the nature? Uh, is it really nature or is it a culture imposing a culture uh, onto nature? So the some of the words uh, you see on the postcards are national resources, nativism, nationality of animals, natural resources, nationality of birds, nationality of nature, nat national border, natural border. But it's also myself being naturalized citizen. I became an American citizen uh, 2003 and it's the whole process is naturalization. So I was kind of a plain idea of that um, nature in this way. And this is again, uh, many thoughts going through when I'm in woods and this is a, some of the uh, meditation on that uh, with that image and text. Uh, woods are filled with the sound of a cicada. Also 2020 was a year of a cicada, almost drowning the sound of birds and fighter jets from a nearby Air Force base. I just wanted to kind of create the kind of a, here in the beautiful nature, but we are very close proximity to a Air Force base nearby. And that's where I was earlier telling you the uh, boxcar was being housed. Um, like on the left floor, the invasive honeysuckle retains its leaves later into winter than most native trees and shrubs. And gradually I started thinking about uh, invasive plants resilience and what we learn from them, how to survive um, in, in terms of my sort of a involvement with a lot of uh, activism. And this is the, uh, I used the uh, preserved moss to cover boots. And this is the uh, field guide that I provided because of the Chapel Hill show. I was not sure whether whether people are allowed to be in the gallery or they're allowed to just see it through the glass. So I provided field guide to just show the words that are being used. And then lastly, just a very quickly, um, I struggle through the, uh, over the years, um, I've been always providing uh, free banners to activists. And I always feel like this is the one way that I can really sort of uh, embed myself to uh, local activism and the street actions. Um, even though my work in the gallery or in a studio is layered and uh, try to put a lot of a thoughtfulness to it. But um, this one is a very opposite. Um, and Basically, just giving um, free banner to everybody who asks for it, and it's not doesn't have my name, and um, um, I'll just read the very last sentence that I remind myself: the goal is not merely envision a new world, but to actively participate in its creation and question and challenge the structure just shape our social landscape. And just I wanted to say that because this, this show is called The New World. And I think our responsibility in our own way, somehow if we can find the sort of a connection to that um, is very important for me. And this is the, um, I'll do the speed through uh, last 
I've done, I've been doing this over 20 years, but this is last 10 years or so. Um, these banners are tossed, you know, handed from people to people. Eventually they disappear. But sometimes I find the banner that I made in Washington. This is a Washington Post that I saw. Well, somebody from this area went to DC. This is a Walmart. Justice for Floyd. This is a young uh, York local youth group led 25 consecutive weekly protest we did 2020. And it's always uh, I do at the request of activists. So they come to me late night. I'm thinking about using this word for the banner. What do you think? Do you think you can do it? Uh, my answer is always, yes, I would do that. And sometimes I'll bring the young people, participant, helper to do a big production. This was uh, leading up to the 2020 election. We did the installation on the wall. And now the people, uh, the request comes from um, Pittsburgh. This is, I made for a people on East Palestine. Um, I made one, two, three, four variation of it to East Palestine, Pittsburgh, and other nearby town. And um, overnight ship them because usually the request comes two days before their um, you know, direct action. This is Akron activist. Um, in love, rage, and solidarity, and uh, I, I'd like all of us to uh, be that person whose uh, local activist can call you and uh, ask for uh, any type of sort of a assistant, either a media assistance or visual messaging or some sort of other creative strategy. Um, and that's my sort of a hope. So this wraps up my presentation. Thank you for listening. Wonderful, thank you, Megua. Um, this is a great time for us to have questions. If folks have questions, go ahead and pop them into the chat and I will read them to Miguel. Um, So Miguel, let's let's start with, um, you have a really distinct color palette. Can you talk a little bit about uh, how you've selected or how you've grown into your limited color palette or um, kind of schemes or just give a little more context for that. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, I I do that uh, on, on purpose. Um, the If I end up using many colors, people tends to react to colors before anything. Uh, a pretty or a color combination. And because my work is really conceptual and I didn't want people to, I didn't want to give more people to respond uh, other aspect of it. And so by really sort of a controlling the color palette that it's more uh, the concept behind it becomes more uh, clear, but it's also, uh, like I said, that my material uh, choice varies from fabric to plaster, cyanotypes, and sometimes I build the cabinets. And so those becomes uh, more of a focus point than color combination or prettiness or whatever that color brings. It's a powerful thing, the color. So I just wanted to um, only use it for effectively in order to make a point. Wonderful. 
Uh, we have a question from uh, Priscilla. I can tell you research your topics deeply. Can you say something about the role of research in your work? Um, yes, um, I do. But it's also, I do do a lot of readings and research, but it's also, um, I'm not an expert, right, of, of, of the field. So I'm not a ecologist. I'm not, the, you know, a scientist. So I'm not, uh, I'm not a lawyer about, you know, immigration lawyer. But I, I think the art has a unique position that it's actually, we are allowed to fly over many different discipline and field and then create another point of a, a point of entry to understand that whatever the topic that I'm uh, researching. And the research is also, it's not a, even, a, might not be a um, correct way, the word, but I do uh, read a lot of uh, different writings. And, um, but it's also, I'm at the same time when I create it, I try to leave it behind because a lot of times there's a trap. If you try to really say what you read about, the work becomes very didactic. And I, I, as much as I want to share those information, I also want to still believe in the power of poetry, um, the, the space that we create, um, that poetic space is important for us to understand something that it's important in a deeper way. Uh, and expert has their work and then they, you can go there to learn more about a uh, certain aspect of that topic, but I will provide that sort of a poetic space the poetic doesn't mean that it doesn't have any rigor in preparation. Poetic is not about creating a mood. Uh, so I'm very sort of a, I tried to apply my own rigor into this space. Um, and more you do the reading, later those things will um, float up when I'm looking for some connection or some form. And then more you do the homework and the reading and the preparation, uh, those things will kind of float up from here and then from there, and then creates the kind of a new space that um, that I will grab it. But if without that homework, uh, I won't be able to recognize that that moment to grab combination. All right, we have a question from Brenda. Well, actually a few questions. So uh, what sparked your start as a visual creative? Who are your favorite artists? And do you have a mentor who helped you build your practice? Um, you know, I thought about that actually in preparation. Um, you know, because my background is also a literature that I might... Uh, so my um, inspiration always comes from writers, uh, um, but it's also a writer like a philosopher uh, or a human geologist who sort of a, think about a space in a sort of a very different way. Um, also like Gaston Bachelard, Yifu Tuan, um, Susan Stewart. There's a difficult people to read but it's also because I'm reading in English, uh, sometimes in, in Japanese, of course, um, I've done that too, in the two languages, but it's, um, those are the kind of uh, inspiration that I draw, uh, but it's also, um, again, I'm not really sort of pushing my visual language, but it's more of a spatial language that, um, how the each work will uh, speak within the space. So I'm also very interested in architectural philosophy, like a Japanese philosophy of Ma, which is the uh, 
a space between things, also also time between things. Uh, those are the kind of my inspiration. And what started, what sparked your start as a visual creative? Um, visual great. this is like a very, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people say that, but I grew up in a sort of a very uh, artistic household. So the uh, my mother uh, wanted to be a painter, but she was not allowed to be in that society. Was not she? She was told that she won't be able to make it as a painter because she was a woman. So she became a hat designer. Uh, now in Japan, in the fifties, people were not wearing women were not wearing hats because still people, some people are wearing kimono. Uh, but she, that was the closest that she wanted to do. Basically she wanted to do a sculpture, make a sculpture. So she made a hat out of a insect skin, hat out of a bamboo, uh, bamboo sticks, stuff like that. And also she always uh, pointed if we were, riding a subway in Tokyo, she would say, look at that yellow that woman is wearing or something like that without saying anything more. So when she says things like that, I'm always thinking about what does she mean by look at that yellow? And that moment, there's a several things that you think about that yellow. So I kind of grew up in that uh, environment, but it's also, there's a lot of artistic sort of a, uh, people around my growing up. So in terms of expressing visual um, in the visual language is always very from early on. Wonderful. Uh, Carrie has a question kind of within comment as well. Your attention to immersion in language and the ways you present your insights seem unusual in relation to other artists. How does your bilingual existence affect that complicated usage? Yeah, I think that's pretty much everything uh, because I my relationship to language is still very abstract. Lots of mistakes, lots of misunderstanding, my, lots of mispronunciation happens in my relationship to language. But it's also... I think when I get got older, my comfort level in my own life allow me to embrace that space of a language in a between sort of a a space between the languages, and um, and I'm instead of being apologetic, I've been sort of a, using that as my asset when I think about uh, right now, I'm creating a, another series of work that it's all about margins, uh, the space between the text. That's where your thoughts land. And, uh, and I'm trying to pry open that space wider to create the kind of a, a new way of new, new, new work. Wonderful. I think that's a really excellent place for us um, to end the conversation. Thank you again, Miguel, for the generosity of your time and talent. And thank you all for joining us for this artist talk by Miguel Arimo as part of our programming for A New World, Ohio Women to Watch 2023. I'd like to give a special thank you to our curators, Sora Kang and Matt Distel, the other participating artists, as well as the Ohio Arts Council's board, the Ohio legislature, and the governor who supports the OAC, this great space, and of course, Ohio artists.